Welcome to Radiologist Headquarters. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and it's time for five cases in about five minutes. Musculoskeletal imaging number four. I'm going to show each unknown case slide for about 10 seconds, and feel free to pause and study the images further. I'll then review the findings, reveal the diagnosis, and move on to the next case. Ready? Let's go. Case one, single slide. All right, so here we're looking at a frontal and an oblique view of the foot, and you can see that there's disruption at the junction between the tarsal bones of the midfoot and the metatarsals of the forefoot, and that's known as a Liz Frank fracture dislocation, named after the pioneering French surgeon Jacques Liz Frank. So normally these first three metatarsals will articulate with the first three cuneiform bones, and then the fourth and fifth metatarsals will articulate with the cuboid. So it's important when you're looking at a foot x-ray to make sure that everything's lining up normally at this Liz Frank joint. Specifically, the lateral border of the first metatarsal here should line up with the lateral border of the first cuneiform bone, just like the medial border of the second metatarsal should line up with the medial border of the second cuneiform bone. In this case, all of the metatarsals, the first through the fifth metatarsals, are displaced laterally. So that's known as a homolateral Liz Frank fracture dislocation. However, you can also have a divergent injury where you have lateral displacement of those second through fifth metatarsals, but then the first metatarsal is displaced medially. And these can be subtle injuries, actually, if you're not looking out for them. So it's good to have a high index of suspicion for a Liz Frank fracture dislocation anytime you're reading a foot x-ray in the setting of trauma. On a lateral view, you might also see a dorsal step off at the level of this fracture dislocation. So that can be helpful. All right, case two, slide one of two. Slide two of two. So here we're looking at a frontal view of the knee, x-ray, and then we see the tibia, fibula, and femur, which look normal, but then it's important to also look at the patella on the frontal view because that's where you may pick up patellar fractures, or in this case, the patella is abnormally high riding. And we can see that abnormally high position of the patella much better on the lateral view. That's known as patella alta. And what else do we see? There's extensive soft tissue swelling here in the region of the patella tendon. There's also some linear ossification or an avulsion injury subjacent to the patella. So this appearance is highly suspicious for patellar tendon rupture. Rupture of this tendon usually occurs at the patellar or tibial attachment in the setting of trauma, but if it's due to a systemic illness, it's more commonly to tear in the mid portion, the mid substance of the tendon. Now, what's more common, patellar tendon rupture or quadriceps tendon rupture? Right, quadriceps tendon rupture is more common. And now how can you make this diagnosis? Well, the insol salvati ratio is very helpful to evaluate for abnormal patellar position. And in that case, you would measure the patellar tendon length and then also the patellar length, which is the greatest pole to pole length. So you can see it's slightly oblique there. And then when you divide that ratio, normal is 0.8 to 1.2. Patella baja, which is an abnormally low patella, which you would see with quadriceps tendon rupture, that would be less than eight. Greater than 1.2, as in this case, would be patella alta. Keep in mind these numbers are specific for plain film. If you're reading MRI, the numbers will be a bit higher. And here's the corresponding MRI, sagittal fluid sensitive sequence of fat suppression. And you can see the patellar tendon is torn here at the patellar attachment, and then the remaining tendon is undulating a bit because it's lax. We also see soft tissue edema. There's the intact anterior cruciate ligament. All right, case three, slide one of two. Slide two of two. Okay, so we're looking at a frontal view, an odontoid view of the cervical spine here, and then this is a lateral view. And on this odontoid view, notice how the lateral mass of C1 is displaced laterally relative to the C2 lateral mass. The dens looks intact, but there's disruption of C1, and this is consistent with a Jefferson fracture. This is an axial loading injury, and the classic history is when a patient dives headfirst into shallow water, causing this burst fracture of the C1 vertebral body, the atlas. The lateral view is important because you want to look at that atlantodentate interval here, this predentate space. That's normally less than three millimeters in adults and less than five millimeters in children. If this is widened, it may indicate an injury, an associated injury to that transverse atlantal ligament. That's important because if that ligament's intact, it may allow this fracture to be treated conservatively. In this case, the atlantodentate interval is normal. 
So let's look at the axial CT images through this level. There's the dense here in the anterior arch of C1, the lateral masses. And notice how we have fractures through both sides of that C1 arch anteriorly, as well as the posterior arch of C1 here on the right. Also, carefully look for any potential vertebral artery injury, particularly if the vertebral foramina are involved. All right, case four, single slide. Here we're looking at two views of the right shoulder, and you can see the shoulder joint is intact, and we don't see evidence of fracture, but we see numerous small little ossific densities scattered about the shoulder joint, all similar in size, and this is characteristic of synovial osteochondromatosis. It's not really known what causes this. It's a synovial metaplasia and proliferation that gives you these multiple intraarticular cartilaginous loose bodies that may or may not ossify. When they're not ossified, the term synovial chondromatosis is preferred. These patients often have pain and swelling. They might have limited range of motion and it's a progressive disease that's seen more commonly in males. It tends to affect a single joint, monoarticular, and it's actually more common in the knee, up to 70% of cases, and then the hip, elbow, shoulder is actually less common. Interestingly, the bursa or tendon sheaths may also be involved. And you may also see changes of pressure erosion involving the adjacent bone, and that can be helpful particularly when you have just synovial chondromatosis that you won't see the ossific densities on x-ray, but you may see apple core remodeling of the neck, particularly of the femoral neck, when it occurs in the hip. All right, final case, single slide. So here we're looking at a CT scan of the ankle in a pediatric patient, which you can tell because the growth plates are not entirely fused. Here are the axial, coronal, and sagittal reformatted images. And the fracture we're seeing here is a specific type of fracture known as a triplane fracture. And this fracture is interesting because it only occurs in adolescence because the growth plate starts to fuse medially, but then that leaves the lateral aspect open, which makes it prone to this type of fracture. And you can think of this as a type four Salter-Harris fracture because it's composed of a vertical fracture through the epiphysis that we have here and here, and then also a horizontal fracture through the growth plate, which we have there and on this image, and then also an oblique fracture through the metaphysis, which we can see on the sagittal reformatted image. And so because of that, it's known as a triplane fracture. And for treatment, these often require open reduction and internal fixation, and they can be complicated by growth plate arrest. And this is different from the Talot fracture, which is only a Salter three fracture. So remember that that's involving the epiphysis and the growth plate, but it does not involve the metaphysis. So that's why you need multiple views to accurately make this diagnosis. All right, now it's time for a rapid review. Let's go through all those cases again quickly. There's the Liz Frank fracture dislocation occurring at the tarsal metatarsal articulation. Remember that the first three metatarsals articulate with the first three cuneiforms and the fourth and fifth metatarsals articulate with the cuboid bone. Homolateral is when there's lateral displacement. Divergent is when there's lateral displacement of the second through fifth metatarsals and medial displacement of the first metatarsal. Patellar tendon rupture, less common than quadriceps tendon rupture, characterized by patella alta, which we can measure with the insol salvati ratio greater than 1.2. Jefferson fracture is an axial load burst fracture of C1. Look for that offset lateral mass of C1 relative to C2. And also importantly, look for the atlantodentate interval to make sure it's normal, less than three millimeters in adults, less than five millimeters in children. If that's widened, it may indicate associated transverse atlantal ligament disruption, which may prevent conservative treatment of the Jefferson fracture. Synovial osteochondromatosis, most common in the knee, but can also occur in the shoulder. A monoarticular disorder with multiple small ossific loose bodies or cartilage that may also cause pressure erosion as well as limited range of motion, pain, and swelling. Finally, the triplane fracture specifically occurs in adolescence as the growth plate fuses medially but leaves the lateral aspect open, and it's considered a Salter four type fracture involving a vertical epiphyseal, horizontal growth plate, and oblique metaphyseal component. Okay, that's it for five cases in five minutes, musculoskeletal imaging number four. I hope that you enjoyed this lecture, and if so, please subscribe to the video podcast or on YouTube. To see bonus teaching material posted throughout the week, click the YouTube community tab or follow us on social media. Until next time, radiology is life.